Good morning, everybody. Welcome to worship on this fourth Sunday in Pentecost, or the fourth Sunday after the day of Pentecost. Glad that you're able to gather together here for worship with us from wherever you are. Uh, we are, uh, it, our numbers have been great on these uh, uh, weekly online worships, so people who are uh, no longer in Arizona have gotten uh, online and are continuing to watch us. It's kind of a neat, uh, uh, neat effect of the current uh, situation. Today in worship, we have a couple of special treats. We have, uh, we have with us today uh, Patrick Burns, who's going to play a prelude of Amazing Grace on the bagpipes. Uh, he's using what he calls small pipes, a little different from uh, normal normal bagpipes, but they are make a great sound, just a lot of fun. Uh, we'll have them again here in a couple of weeks doing something as well. Also, we've gotten uh, Lincoln uh, out from behind the organ console so that he could uh, sing a solo for us today, accompanied by Jill Voss. So those are things that are part of our worship today. So and without any uh, further ado, I just want us to, to move ahead then with worship. So I invite you to take this time uh, during the prelude, prepare, prepare yourselves for worship with a time of prayer and reflection. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose steadfast love is everlasting, whose faithfulness endures from generation to generation. Amen. 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 Trusting in the mercy of God, let us confess our sin. Reconciling God. We, we confess, confess that we do not trust your abundance, and we deny your presence in our lives. We place our hope in ourselves and rely on our own efforts. We fail to believe that you provide enough for all. We abuse your good creation for our own benefit. We fear difference and do not welcome others as you have welcomed us. We sin, thought, word, and healing. By your grace, forgive us. Through your love, renew us. And in your spirit, lead us so that we may live to serve you in the newness of life. Amen. Beloved of God, by the radical abundance of divine mercy, we have peace with God through Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained grace upon grace. Our sins are forgiven. Let us live now in hope, for hope does not disappoint, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Thank you. 
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also, and also with you. you. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord for the peace from above and for our salvation. Let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Lord. Let us pray. O oh God, you direct our lives by your grace and your words of justice and mercy reshape the world. Mold us into a people who welcome your word and serve one another through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. reading today is from Romans 6 chapter. Do not let sin exercise dominion in your mortal bodies to make you obey their passions. 
No longer present your members to sin as instruments of wickedness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and present your members to God as instruments of righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Should we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that you, having once been slaves of sin, have become obedient from the heart to the form of teaching to which you are entrusted, and that you, having been sent free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to greater and greater iniquity, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness for sanctification. When you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. So what advantage did you then get from the things of which you now are ashamed? The end of those things is death. But now that you have been freed from sin and enslaved to God, the advantage you get is sanctification. The end is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Your love, O Lord, forever will I sing. From age to age, my mouth will proclaim your faithfulness. For I am persuaded that your steadfast love is established forever. You have set your faithfulness firmly in the heavens. I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn an oath to David, my servant. I will establish your life forever and preserve your throne for all generations. Happy are the people who know the festal shout. They walk with the Lord in the light of your presence. They rejoice daily. Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 10th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to the twelve, Whoever welcomes you welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward, and whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of the righteous. And whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, truly I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. So what does this text tell me to do? That's how we often approach the Bible. It's sort of like a a rule book for Christian living. Looking at it this way, today's text says, Welcome people. Practice hospitality and give a cup of cold water. End of sermon. Sorry. If you read this more carefully, what it really says is receive welcome, expect hospitality, and those who offer you a cup of cold water will find their reward. 
This particular passage is not about sitting in the safety of your own church and being gracious and hospitable to whoever happens to show up. Jesus' words at the end of Matthew's 10th chapter are a word of promise under the broader commandment to follow Jesus out into the world in mission. Jesus tells his disciples, as it were, I'm sending you into a dangerous world as a part of my mission to love and to save and to bless and to be reconciled to that very world. It's dangerous out there, but you will find welcome and those who welcome you and who receive you also welcome and receive me, and they will be rewarded. So what does this mean for ministry? Well, in part it means that our ministries have to get out of the building. It means that we, as Christian disciples, do not do all or even our best work here in the building. We've got to get out there. We've got to get out there and offer ourselves up as guests to other people's welcome. Not all will welcome you, but some will. And by offering yourself up as a guest to those people to welcome, you will be manifesting for those people the blessing of both the Father in heaven and also of the beloved Son. Imagine that. Merely by offering yourself up as the guest of another person's welcome, you will manifest for them the very reign of God. Okay, I admit that this message sounds almost absurd right now in the midst of this COVID-19 pandemic, where the common wisdom is, stay home. But at the same time that we are in the midst of this crisis, we are also in the midst of another crisis a crisis of conscience, or at least we should be. Overcoming the persistent plague of racism requires the kind of radical missionary outreach about which Jesus is speaking today. It requires stepping out of our comfort zones, putting ourselves in a position to be welcomed and to receive hospitality. It requires unstopping our ears, our hearts, and allowing ourselves to be those to whom a cup of cold water may be offered. At CTL, a member related this story after last week's sermon. They said, we home hosted a young black man from Tennessee for these past several months until the state pretty much reopened. He was a field organizer for the Democratic Party. Anyway, while he was a guest in our home, we heard several stories of his experiences since he was a young boy with racism and how he feels he has to conduct himself, particularly in Arizona. It hurts my heart, she related, to know and to see along with all of the white privilege that I and my family have enjoyed. Yes, choosing to recognize this and to take action is the response that is needed, and I hope that it is the impetus for change in America. The figurative cup of cold water in this particular case is the real-life stories of a befriended soul in one's own house. I want to tell you another personal story of a turning point in my life. Like all of you, I wish we weren't dealing with COVID-19. And someday, when we're not, I think a few of us should set out on a mission of listening, something like this one. I was serving St. Luke Lutheran Church in Cuyahoga Falls. Now, during the Civil Rights Movement, Cuyahoga Falls had become known as Caucasian Falls, for reasons you can imagine. By 1988, there were still only a half a dozen or so children of color in the public school system. And I had a, a confirmation class that just could not wrap their minds around the issues of racism and the challenges that black children face. So I went to East Cleveland. Now East Cleveland is one of those neighborhoods white people avoid. 95% African American population, 40% of the families there living in poverty. 
I went to Calvary Lutheran Church on Euclid Avenue one morning to explore with their pastor the possibility of doing a joint retreat with our two confirmation classes. We made some tentative plans, and as I was leaving, I noticed that the church's food pantry was open that morning and people were coming and going. I held the door for an older woman leaving with a couple of grocery bags and a pull-behind cart, you know, those little two-wheel jobs. The bus was just pulling away from the curb in front of the church, and she complained, that was my bus. I'll never, I'll have to wait for an hour to catch the next one. So I looked around, and I didn't see another white face in any direction. Now, it felt strange to notice that in light of what I was hoping to teach my confirmation class. But I said to the woman, I said, ma'am, I have some time. Could I offer you a ride home? I think I was surprised that she agreed. I was driving at that time this little blue Chevy Sprint. That was a tiny little car, and if anybody of you have ever ridden with me before, you know that I had to clean all the stuff off the passenger seat and clean up the, the trash that was laying on the floor on the passenger side of the car in order for her to get into it. I had no idea where I was going, and that was long before Google Maps. She directed me, and she made polite conversation. She was a very friendly woman. We pulled up in front of an apartment building, three stories maybe, I suppose. It was set back from the street. There were steps that led up to the front door of the building where there was a stoop, and there were several men sitting there on the stoop having conversation. And I asked her, can I help carry these things to your apartment? She thanked me for my kindness, and we went up the steps to the building and up the steps further to her second floor apartment. And we put the groceries in the house, in the apartment, and uh, she offered me a drink of water, which I declined at the time. So I left, and when I emerged from the building, I realized that I had no idea where I was nor how to get back to the church. I walked right past the men on the stoop with a casual greeting, and then I went out to the street, and I stood there by my car looking around for a minute. I think at that point, I might have been feeling a little scared, which made me angry with myself. So when I noticed a little restaurant across the street, I walked over and had lunch. We white folks have the privilege of almost never experiencing the sidelong glances one gets and the momentary uncertainty one feels when you walk into a place and are the only person there who is not like everyone else. I sat down at the counter anyway, and a young man came in and sat down next to me, even though there were any number of seats not next to anyone. We ordered, we ate, and we talked. He was a college student studying marine biology, which is uncommon uncommon in any neighborhood in Ohio. I shared that I had a good friend at San Jose State working on his master's degree in the same field. The young man hoped that he could pursue his graduate degree on the West Coast as well. I gave him Tim's number. I asked the cook for directions out of town, and I went home. I hadn't done anything noble or mission-like, but I had received hospitality and welcome. A cup of cold water, figuratively if not literally. It affected my feelings on a lot of things. A few weeks later, I took a half a dozen middle schoolers to Calvary Lutheran Church, white middle schoolers in East Cleveland. We had Bible studies together. We learned a little about the economic, social, and cultural differences we experience. And then we paired the kids up, and all of our kids spent the night in the home of their black partners. I'd like to ask those kids today how they remember that experience. But on the way home, one of the girls in the group, who almost didn't go because she was afraid, thank God for her open-minded parents, she said to me, you know what I learned? They're really just like us. Only life is harder for them sometimes. Unquestionably, (laughs) one of the most rewarding moments in my confirmation ministry. In today's gospel, Jesus reminds us of a very profound privilege. 
and along with that, a tremendous responsibility. He tells us that we represent, we symbolize him before others. He tells us that the reverse is also true, namely that others represent and symbolize him before us. Jesus assures us that he himself is present in our lives when we welcome others into our midst, and he is also present when others welcome us. Jesus is present each and every day in the hospitality that we offer others and that others offer us. How often do we really realize this? I mean, what a privilege and a responsibility that is. And what a challenge it is. What a joy, what a gift, what a blessing. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a great Lutheran scholar and pastor, said it very well. He said, the bearers of Jesus' word receive a final word of promise for their work. They are now Christ's fellow workers and will be like him in all things. Thus they are to meet those to whom they are sent as if they were Christ himself. And when they are welcomed into a house, Christ enters with them. They are bearers of his presence. They bring with them the most precious gift in the world, the gift of Jesus Christ. We are all of us Christ bearers before others in our homes, in the church, in the school, at work, at play, in the whole world. What would happen if every day we were always conscious of this truth and did our best to put it into practice? When we offer and receive hospitality, Jesus is made present. This is truly the most precious gift that we could give to anyone or receive from anyone. It has been correctly noted that our society, even if not especially the religious community, works on the basis of mutual invitations. Lutherans invite Lutherans, black people invite black people, rich people invite rich people, and as long as we conduct ourselves in such a way, we have the convenience of always speaking our own religious and cultural language. Intellectually and spiritually, we live comfortably. But Jesus, he's not very enthusiastic about it. He tells us that the real meaning of hospitality isn't found in inviting someone who cannot repay you, someone who is unfamiliar to you, listening to people with whom you disagree, eating with people who are not like you, then the concept of invitation, of hospitality, receives a Christ-related meaning. To be faithful disciples, we need to push the boundaries of what we find comfortable and easy. It is hard for many of us. But with God's help, it is not impossible. It can start in the smallest of ways. Amen. Now let us confess our faith together in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Called into unity with one another and with the whole of creation, let us pray for our shared world. 
O God of companionship, encourage our relationships with our siblings in Christ. Bless our conversations, shape our shared future, and give us hearts eager to join in a festal shout of praise. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. O God of abundance, you make your creation thrive and grow to provide all that we need. Inspire us to care for our environment and be attuned to where the earth is crying out. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. God of mercy, your grace is poured out for all. Inspire authorities, judges, and politicians to act with compassion and justice. Teach us to overcome fear with hope, meet hate with love, and welcome one another as we would welcome you. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. O God of care, accompany all who are in deepest need. Strengthen those who are in prison or awaiting trial. Comfort those who are sick, lonely, or abandoned. Especially, Lord, hear our prayers for those in our midst in need of your care. For Jackie and Katie, George, Sherry, Jaron, Rich, Rod, Ron, Raylan, Tony, Laura, Sasha, John, Patsy, Julia. For Mary Lou, Julie Weston's daughter, Kay, Mark, Barb and Dave, Stacy, Larry, Norm, Jim, Scott, Susan, Richard, Donna, Jory and Lester, Mike, Anthony, Julie, Joel, Kirsten, Todd, Joe, Sandy, Ellen, Aiden, Randy, Paul, Humberto, Tom, Karin. Amy, Linda, Tom, Debbie, Dave, Ellen, John, Larry, Lana, Monica, Ken, Joe, Tony, Mark, Joel, Jeff, Jean, Donna, Dave. And all of those, Lord, whom we name before you now. Renew the spirits of all who call upon you. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. O God of community, we give thanks for this congregation. Give us passion to embrace your mission and the vision to recognize where you are leading us. Teach us how to live more faithfully with each other. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Receive these prayers, O God, and those too deep for words. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Oh, may God's house be 
Let us pray. O God of goodness and growth, all creation is yours, and your faithfulness is as firm as the heavens. Water and word, wine and bread, these are signs of your abundant grace. Nourish us through these gifts, that we might proclaim your steadfast love in our communities and in the world. Through Jesus Christ, our strength and our song. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It's right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. in which he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and he gave it to his disciples saying take and eat this is my body which is given for you do this for the remembrance of me and again after supper he took the cup and when he had given thanks he gave it for all to drink saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin do this for the remembrance of me for as often as we eat of this bread and we drink of this cup, we remember the Lord's death until he comes again.
pray together as our Lord taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and give us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen us and keep us in his grace. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. O God of the welcome table, in this meal we have feasted on your goodness and have been united by your presence among us. Empower us to go forth, sustained by these gifts, so that we may share your neighborly love with all. Through Jesus Christ, the giver of abundant life. Amen. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor anything present or things to come, or powers, or heights, or depths, or anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. God the Creator, Jesus the Christ, the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, bless you and keep you in eternal love.
least serve the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Amen.